organization agent in Suriname, my honor to participate in DGH training seminar. I'm a neurologist from Peking University of Western Hospital. Today, my topic is dysphagia in stroke patients. Stroke is a common disease in China as well as in the United States. It's one of the leading causes of deaths across the world. Actually, many stroke patients did not die of stroke itself. They died of the complications of the stroke. For example, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, DVT. Dysphagia is one of these complications of stroke. Today, we'll begin with the physiology of swelling process. Then, we'll talk about clinical future of dysphagia of stroke, later the assessment and management of dysphagia in stroke patients. Swelling is an ordinary physiological movement in our life. It works when we eating, drink, uh, drinking, or dealing with oral secretion. The definition of swelling is the act in which a food or liquid virus is transported from the mouth through the pharynx and the esophagus into the stomach. That means from the mouth into the stomach. Actually, swelling is a complex series of <coughs> voluntary and involuntary neuromuscular contractions proceeding. Five pairs of cranial nerves, the fifth, seventh, ninth, tenth, and twelfth, and the facial and the oral muscles are involved in swelling. This picture shows some structures associated with swelling. It's a soft palate, it's tongue, and epiglottis. Epiglottis is a very important structure in swelling that protects airway. This space is called naryja vestibule. It's a vocal cord. Below vocal cord is trachea. And the esophagus is here. Swelling process can be divided into three phases. In oral phase, food is chewed and mixed with oral secretion, then form, formed into food burners. The tongue prepared food burners backward. Pharyngeal phase is of particular importance because aspiration is the most most <coughs> is most likely to occur in this phase. In pharyngeal phase, two, prote uh, two protective involuntary reflexes are triggered. One is the elevation of soft palate that prevents food burners from entering nasal cavity. The other is the is the other is that the nerving is moved forward and up, uh, forward and upward, and the epiglottis falls downward, close the entrance of trachea from it, and uh, prevents the foot burners from entering airway. And in the phagial phase, foot burners is trans transported through esophagus into the stomach. The definition. Uh, dysphagia is a uh, difficulty in certainly moving a burner from the mouth to the stomach without aspiration and then may also involve difficulty in oral preparation for the swollen. That means dysphagia is any problem in the process from mouth to the stomach. Dysphagia is one of the commonest complications in stroke. The incidence is reported from 22% to 65%. This value is very great because it depends on when to detect, in acute phase or subacute phase, and how to detect, which method is used to assess the swelling function and the selection of sample. In most stroke patients, swelling disorder occurs in oral phase and pharyngeal phase. And stroke is considered as the leading cause of orofaryngeal dysphagia. Dysphagia phase is often interacting in stroke patients. The mechanism of dysphagia after stroke are not very clear. The impairment of pharyngeal sensory, the weakness of orofaryngeal muscle, and the delayed or absence of reflex 
participate in the development of this phase of stroke. Some researchers indicated that the spandum of critical pharyngeal muscle may cause dysphagia in some brainstem stroke patients. And the, the discoordination between swallow and breast is reported to be associated with dysphagia in some cases. Those stroke patients with dysphagia may present with a, a, a variety of clinical symptoms and the signs. They often report coughing, urine, or shortening after eating or drinking. We can ask this patient to pronounce R, then ask them to swallow five or 10 milliliters of water, then pronounce R again. You can hear a change in voice. It's called wet voice. And these patients may have weakness of voluntary cough. In some patients, in some dysphagic patients, we can detect uh, abnormal gap reflex, but this is not very specific and uh, sensitive. Consequences of this failure include malnutrition, dehydration, aspiration, and uh, pneumonia. As a patient's ability to swallow is impaired, so uh, adequate, uh, adequate dietary intake becomes a uh, challenge. In some cases, Malnutrition and dehydration are due to in, improper dietary limitation from medical staffs. And then malnutrition and dehydration may, call, may impair immune function and then make this stroke patient vulnerable to infections. In, isca in ischemic stroke patients, dehydration may cause a hypercoagulative state and then induce a progression of stroke. Aspiration is the most immediate danger to care. This picture shows the back barrier has passed the level of vocal cord and entered the trachea. This is the barrier. It's called aspiration. Aspiration may present with a triple threat, triple threat chemical pneumonitis, bacterial pneumonia, and a, mechan a mechanical obstruction of the airway. Uh, a systematic review indicated the, in, the incidence of pneumonia in stroke patients with dysphagia are about three times high, higher than those patients without dysphagia. Fortunately, in most stroke patients, dysphagia is transient. From 43% to 86% of, patient, of patients will recover their swallowing function within four weeks after stroke onset. Is good. But it doesn't mean that when we meet with a stroke patient with this patient, we should do nothing, just waiting for its recovery. Because this failure may be self limited. But the consequence caused by this failure pneumonia, hydration, and dehydration, and malnutrition are not. Sometimes these complications after, after this failure may be fatal. So early assessment and management of dysphagia in stroke patients is very important. In the assessment of dysphagia, there are two levels. <coughs> First is screening test. The second is instrumental evaluation. American Heart Association stroke guidelines require that all stroke patients should re receive screening test before be giving any food or drink. A <coughs> uh, screen test should be completed within the first 24 hours after admission. It's usually, it's usually an undertaken by nurses and the residents. The goal of screen test is to identify the risk of this patient. What is warning test is a common screening test in clinical practice. The process is ask the patients to sit upright and swallow 5 ml of water 3 times, then 15 ml of water. During the process, observe whether this patient has choking, coughing, or wet voice. If the patient, if there is any abnormal sign, we can say this patient may have dysphagia and need further evaluation. Pass oximeter is a non-invasive method. There is a small clip is placed on one finger, and the machine shows the anterior 
arterial oxygen saturation. Then we ask this patient to swallow 10 milliliters of water. If the saturation, the oxygen saturation decreases more than 2% from baseline during swallowing, it indicates aspiration. The principle of this method is aspiration may cause reflex product constriction, ventilation, perfusion imbalance, and hypoxia. However, this method does not fit for all subjects and those patients with lung disease. <coughs> In my hospital, we use standardized swelling assessment as a screen protocol. This, this, uh, this test involves the assessment of consciousness, uh, post, uh, postural control, voluntary cough, the control of the saliva, and the assessment of facial muscles, that, as well as the sword swelling test. During this during this, pro uh, during this process, if there is any abnormal sign, we should stop the test, and this patient is considered to be dysphagic. For those patients who failed in screen test, instrumental evaluation is needed. The goal of instrumental evaluation is to confirm the diagnosis of dysphagia, to investigate the mechanism of dysphagia and to evaluate, to evaluate the efficiency of compensatory treatment. Video fluoroscopy and fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swelling are the two common instrumental evaluation tests in clinical practice. Video fluoroscopy, also called modified variable swelling, has been recognized as the gold standard Gold standard for orthopedia swelling test. It may show a complete dynamic swelling procedure. Patients sit upright here and ask the patients to swallow barrier of different volume and a different consistency. Then we can view the anterior to posterior or naturally. If video fluoroscopy shows the signs of aspiration, we were trying some compensatory treatment. Then we will test the efficiency of this treatment with VF. There is some pictures of abnormal signs in VF. Here, the white is a barrier. The barrier has entered the hypopharynx. However, the swollen reflex has not initiated. It's called a split. And here, the barium has passed the level of vocal cord and entered the trachea. It's aspiration. <coughs> At this patient, because of the delayed epidural occlusion, the barium has entered the rigid vestibule. Then expelled quickly without aspiration. It's called penetration. From natural projection, we can see barium residual in vernacular and the piriform sinuses. And this is anterior to posterior projection. There is a symmetrical residual of barium in bilateral piriform sinuses. But during the process of video fluoroscopy, patients need to be exposed to radiation. And the VF could not be conducted at by sign, patients need to go need to, go to the radiology department to receive this test. So it's very difficult for acute stroke patients to receive this test. Fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swelling fees is another choice of instrumental test. It utilizes the endoscopic to observe the structure associated with swelling. This test may provide us with information about the swelling process and the pharyngeal motility. <coughs> In some stroke patients, this will not observe the aspiration directly, but it can be inferred from other indirect signs, such as injection of material out of the trachea of the body, or the foot left on the vocal cord. This can be conducted at bedside 
It's a very important advantage for its use in acute stroke patients. Then we show several, uh, we show three videos to show the process of this. Endoscopy is inserted in the locality. This is the entrance of high pharynx and it's a soft appendage. We ask the patient to swallow, so we can evaluate the movement of soft appendage. This is a called, uh, it's called a white knight period because uh, because the uh, because the soft palate closed the entrance of hand pharynx so we can <coughs> then the endoscopy moves downwards it's the base of the tongue is epiglottis. Ask the patient to pronounce E. We can observe piriform sinuses, vocal cord. This space is called the radial vestibule. Then we can see there is no food or saliva left in the piriform sinuses. Ask the patient to breathe. We can see, we can observe the trachea. The movement of vocal cords are symmetric. Then we perform a food bonus trial. Ask the patient to swallow some food dyed with blue. The patients put the food into the, uh, the the nurse put the food into the patient's mouth. The endoscope is returned to a regional position outside of the outside of the heart pharynx. Because of because of because, because soft panic closed the entrance of of heart pharynx, endoscopy could not observe the pharyngeal phase of swan directly. After swallowing, we can see some food, some that uh, some blue food left at the age of uh, epiglottis is normal. There is no food left in piriform sinuses and the regional vascular or vocal cords. And then no and no food residue in trachea. <coughs> from the from this indirect signs we can conclude that there was no aspiration in the previous swallowing process. We, uh, there are pictures that show the abnormal signs in the in face. This is bleed, the food has entered the high pharynx but no swallowing effects. And this food passed past the epiglottis and then entered the, the regional vestibule is penetration. And a, a large amount of food residue by natural piriform sinus and the vernacular. And here, food has passed the local cord and entered to here. It's aspiration. This can detect an aspiration of saliva. It's passing through local cord. Aspiration of the saliva indicates a very severe dysphagia. However, video fluoroscopy will not detect it because there is no barrier in the saliva. But this will not provide the information about oral and esophageal stage of swallowing. Since in most stroke patients, dysphagia is transient, the Treatment of this feature is focused on the prevention of the complications of this feature to prevent 
aspiration pneumonia prevent malnutrition and dehydration. To those patients with persisting dysphagia, provide them with exercise to recover their swallowing function. In clinical practice, the first question in management of dysphagia is whether this patient may keep oral feeding. This choice is dependent on the results of the, of the patient's swallowing function. This is a protocol in my department. All stroke patients receive swollen screen test within the first 24 hours. If the screen test is normal, patients may receive normal diet. If there is any abnormal signs, this patient needs further evaluation. According to the results of instrumental evaluation, some patients may receive normal diet. Some patients may keep oral feeding with compensatory treatment, and others need alternative feeding. Compensatory treatment include postural changes, modifying volume and the speed of food presentation, and modifying food consistency. This is, a, this is an example of postural change. This patient was 78 years old. He was admitted to our hospital because of a new onset of coffee during drinking. And the cranial MRI has confirmed the diagnosis of <coughs> During the admission, video gyroscopy was performed. This patient, <coughs> uh, this patient's one reflex was delayed severely and there is a split and aspiration sign. From anterior to posterior projection, we found, we found, the, we found the liquid diagram often moves, uh, moved downward along the, the right side of his high pharynx. So we asked this patient to rotate his head to the right side to close the entrance of the, of the right hyperpharynx pharynx, and ask him to swallow barium again. This time, the delayed epiglottal closures improved significantly and no signs of aspiration. So this patient was suggested to keep his head rotated to his right side during eating or drinking. He did not cough when this was done, and no pneumonia developed during admission. Modification of food consistency can also reduce the incidence of aspiration pneumonia. If compensatory treatment could not eliminate aspiration, Alternative feeding is necessary. The first choice is the gastro tube feeding. If the patient's dysphagia lasts for more than one month, we may try uh, percutaneous endoscopic, uh, uh, endoscopic gastrostomy for those patients with persisting dysphagia. And there is another example. This patient was 85 years old. He was diagnosed with acute ischemic stroke. This indicated food has entered the high pharynx, but there was no swollen reflex. <coughs> then the food entered the, uh, the rich vestibule and the trachea, asked her to cough. <coughs> You can find the food expired with, uh, mixed with uh, secretion. According to the result of this test, this patient was suggested to commence the gastro tube feed, but she refused. 
unfortunately, within several days later, she died of the body. Okay. This is the end. It's a summary. This feature is a common complication of stroke, and a stroke is the leading cause of oropharyngeal dysphagia. Complications of dysphagia of stroke include penetration, dehydration, aspiration, and pneumonia. There are two levels in the assessment of dysphagia. And the instructions, the management of dysphagia is focused on the prevention of the dysphagia's complications. That's okay. Thank you. say what percentage of stroke patients have dysphagia? I missed that. Uh, it's reported from 22% to 65% stroke patients have dysphagia. But uh, I, I have to say that it, this value varies greatly yeah. because it depends on when to detect. In acute phase, the proportion is high. In subacute phase, it's low. And uh, depending on how to detect the Swelling function with instrumental evaluation, the proportion is high. With clinical examination, uh, like uh, uh, for example, the water swelling test, the proportion is low. And it also depends on the selection of sample. If we choose the breast and stroke patient, the proportion is high. If we choose the mild stroke patient, it, it would be low. So most of what you focused on was management and treatment. Are there any, is there anything that can be done on the prevention side? I mean, I know there's stroke prevention, but prevention of dysphagia, give, given that there's such a high incidence of it in stroke victims, are there, I don't know, like muscle throat, muscle exercises, training you can do to uh, minimize the effects? Uh, because, uh, uh, because the dysphagia in most of the uh, in most of the patients are transient. So the, we focus on the management of its complication. Yeah. And the dysphagia in most stroke patients, the patient uh, most stroke patients may recover may recover as one function within uh, within the first uh, months after the stroke onset. So that, that that range you gave of like forty to eighty percent who actually recover, what would make someone more likely to recover or less likely? To uh, it, uh, the risk factor is age and the severity of stroke uh -huh. and the location of the uh, the nature location and other is uh, uh, this risk uh, this risk uh, factor uh, recognize a complaint and other um, maybe there is other risk factor I'm not sure. So shall we transfer to another topic? So um, my topic today is about the translational uh, stroke research in rural China, and uh, my uh, research maybe uh, covered from the population-based prevention to review-based intervention. I hope so, but maybe something is not <laughs> so so easy. So I declare no uh, conflict of interest. My uh, training program is funded by the from um, Gali. National Center of IH. So today the top uh, today's topic to cover includes these uh, aspects. Uh, firstly, we uh, we can uh, see about the global uh, burden of joke. Just we have the, had some impression from doctor's uh, presentation uh, how how it is very uh, how how it is uh, it is uh, the situation is very. <laughs> it's very amazing or anything like that. So glo from the global view, the point of view, we can have this uh, impression of uh, this picture is adapted from the WHO website and uh, the uh, dark, more <coughs> darker uh, the color means the, the, more, uh, the more days of stroke, uh, from stroke will occur. So actually China 
is the most important uh, country contributed to the death of the joke? Uh, so we talk about the death joke in China. Uh, actually, we have some uh, data from, uh, active data from the uh, stroke journal, which is uh, The stroke mortality in China is about uh, 157 per, per, uh, per 100,000 annually. And the morbidity, morbidity in China is also so high. Uh, actually, uh, in currently, types of this joke is changing. Uh, you know, in the last century in China, maybe the hemorrhagic joke is a, ma is a major type, a dominant type in China, but actually the uh, no, 21st century, we have ischemic joke proves rapidly. So we have all ischemic joke uh, currently in China. It, it is the same as in the United States. So annual cost of uh, stroke care in China is a, is a huge amount, about uh, uh, 40 billion RMB uh, Chinese yuan, uh, which is higher than other cardiovascular diseases. So the data is from the stroke journal. And uh, when we talk about the prevalence uh, in China, we do not have so, so many data, because you know, actually the prevalence study cost so many money and time and uh, labors. So um, in last century, about in the 1980s, we have, uh, uh, we have data from the urology about the 0.53% uh, for age above uh, 40, uh, 45 years old. And um, to, the, to the beginning of this century, uh, 2002, we have data from National Nutrition and Health Survey. So this shows the data increased to the 1.11% uh, for age uh, above the uh, 35 years old. And uh, we have some uh, we have some some impression from this data. Uh, we have a more <coughs> parents, uh, rate in males and uh, in north and in the urban area actually. So this is from the Chinese Journal of Preventive Medicine. Uh, that is a, a data from the national-wide uh, survey. So <coughs> we do not have a, a specific, uh, specific area or community-based uh, studies. So we did uh, a kind of study uh, in a rural area uh, near Beijing city. You know, actually, Beijing is the most big, one of the most biggest city in China. So in that area, we have some uh, community-based studies uh, in 2010. We have 3.7% um, for age above uh, 40 years old in rural population of Beijing, North China. So also in our study, uh, the males had higher prevalence rates than the females. Uh, this data published in BMC Public Health uh, recently. So that uh, let's talk about this uh, study. So this study is uh, by our group. <coughs> Totally, we have uh, 40, 40, uh, 58, nearly 58,000 rural residents in the towns of the uh, area of Be near Beijing. You know, uh, it's, it's China and uh, this is Beijing. And uh, the, uh, this district means, uh, means Fangshan district. It's a rural area uh, just in the west so, uh, west south of Beijing city, and uh, this area is uh, about uh, it is uh, can divide into the plain area, hilly area, and the mountainous area like that. So we use uh, uh, stratif uh, stratified cluster sampling uh, to do this uh, cross section of this uh, study from March 2008 and to August 2010. Um, by this uh, by this data we. Uh, provide updated prevalence of disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, and the major risk factors of this area above the uh, adults, about uh, 40. So let's, uh, let's show us some, some data about uh, in, in this uh, study. Uh, totally, we have uh, a higher chronic heart disease uh, than stroke 
it's impressive because you know uh, in last century when we talk about the cardiovascular disease in China, especially uh, we have some data from the uh, WHO Monica uh, project that is a uh, uh, very famous uh, civilians data for the cardiovascular diseases all over the world, uh, and it includes this uh, project we have seen a Monica uh, project in China. So uh, at that time, stroke is common than the chronic heart diseases, especially for the hemorrhagic stroke I just mentioned. And uh, in our data nowadays, so the, uh, the situation changes. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, some data uh, divided by the males and females also have the same uh, situation. We, all, uh, we also have some uh, risk factors for virus including the diabetes, hypertension, overweight, and obesity. So, uh, yeah, have a look at this. Um, from this picture, we have divided by the geography area. I just mentioned that this area is uh, by three parts of the, uh, the geography, uh, ge uh, geography area, uh, in the mountainous area and the hilly area, and also the area. Uh, this is uh, maybe some geographic disparity uh, in, uh, in this data. So we can show about the, the data. Uh, and also, we have high, highly prevalent chronic heart diseases and do stroke in this area, uh, because this area is near the large antibiotic deficiency in such a major. A problem change the pattern of CVD parents uh, in this area was presented, just as I mentioned, because you know, uh, compared to Western countries, we used to regard more common Joke than CHD in China population, especially in area of uh, rural area. This impression also stems from the much higher in incidence and the mortality <coughs> than CHD based on the Cinemonica project I just mentioned. Cinemonica uh, project is a civilian data and uh, lasts for uh, maybe seven years. Uh, so in our study, a distinctive transition was suggested that much heavy burden of CHD might have already existed in China with a CBD burden similar to the Western country. Although today's topic we talk about this joke, but we should mention this trend because you know actually something interesting later. Um, from the standard Standardized the prevalence CHD and this joke uh, prevalence among this population. We have this impression that uh, you know uh, age more than uh, 65 years and uh, compared to the uh, age less than 50, uh, uh, 65 plus, uh, years, uh, we can have this. Uh, obviously, we have uh, higher higher prevalence. The older age groups, but we can find some disparities. You know, uh, in the, uh, to, to compare in the women, that means uh, the black, the black column. So we, we have we have different we have difference in these uh, groups uh, between CHD and uh, stroke. So that means in older in in elder. Uh, women, they have a higher uh, CHD prevalence, maybe especially the women. So maybe some uh, gender uh, disparities in, in this uh, in this population. Also, we have uh, discussed uh, uh, discussed it in another uh, paper uh, published recently in the Monop Monopoly uh, journal about that. Risk factors, special for women in this area, especially for rural area. Okay, um, so population aging is a very important risk factors of, uh, for for this uh, for, for for this situation. Uh, population might uh, cause uh, increase of CVD prevalence. Obviously, uh, you know, actually we have the United States and uh, the uh, Korean data. Uh, published uh, maybe recently from uh, two, two journals, we can compare that. And also, it was forecasted that CHD incidence and death 
China increased dramatically over 2010-2030 due to population growth in end aging alone. This is published by uh, uh, by data from uh, another Chinese uh, Chinese cohort uh, in the situation cardiovascular quality and outcomes research. Um, so we com uh, we also compared our data with other uh, studies in China. Uh, one study is uh, very uh, important or famous uh, called the Inter Asia study, in which uh, China is a uh, part of the, that study is uh, carried uh, in 2001. Another uh, data is from the suburban district, near, also near Beijing. That is a more developed area than our district. So we can compare what's the difference. So you can uh, see, from, uh, you can find something about the, in, in this picture, uh, which uh, by, by gen, uh, different genders, Actually, in men and in women, we also have a, a increasing trends of the, the risk factors, especially for the obesity. Actually, it's very important. You know, actually, in the United States, obesity is the most important risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. We, we can show also in the rural area in China, we have the same uh, problem uh, because uh, we used to think about uh, China. About, uh, most important risk factor may be hypertension or anything like uh, uh, air pollution, not the obesity. Because you know, actually, obesity is an indicator for the nutritional transition, in, especially in developing country or developing area. So we talk about the nutritional transition. Actually, um, we have some uh, uh, some. Some investigators uh, from Conair China study held in last century, they indicate that the remarkable overweight, o overweight and obesity prevalence probably has a close relationship with nutritional transition in Chinese. That is in the last century. Maybe at that time, China do not have so, uh, have ha not developed as, as now or as nowadays. So at that time, we have this kind of <laughs> hypothesis. So uh, nowadays, we have also have some, uh, have some problems in thought about uh, maybe will uh, contribute to tr about 20% of all primary uh, intracerebral uh, hemorrhages was attributed to add salt to food. You know, actually, Chinese used to eat much salt, especially in some rural area because they have some heavy labor works to do. And also they do not have so many fruits uh, and vegetables to eat. So they just use some uh, some, some salt, vegetables or like, anything like that. So the consumption uh, the consumption of more than five uh, serving of the fruits and vegetables a day is associated with Lower stroke. This is a, 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 a this data is from the uh, recent uh, review of less neurology. So we have some impression <coughs> from uh, this uh, this data, and uh, we also do some prevalence odds ratio to show the relationship between the risk factor and the chronic heart disease, uh, coronary heart disease, and stroke. So we compare the two kind of two types of cardiovascular diseases, we can find that um, all of these uh, risk factors will contribute to the, to the, the cardiovascular events, but they, have to, uh, they do not have the same effects. We can find that the hypertension is the most uh, important risk factor for stroke you know, from the, the, efficient, the coefficients of the, of the prevalence or the ratio we can show the the large uh, prevalence of the ratio in the stroke group. And also, uh, maybe the obesity have more effects on the coronary heart diseases. So we can have this impression. Uh, the increased of the ratio for different types of risk factors will show the different effect on the two types of cardiovascular events. 
And just the difference of the odds ratio of CHT and this joke indicate a closer relationship between this uh, Hartesian joke. Uh, the, the, uh, this, this evidence also uh, supported by the recent uh, inter interest joke study published in Nancy 2010. Uh, when we talk about some uh, some risk factors uh, attributed to the uh, cardiovascular disease, we can have some uh, contribution of selected risk factors to stroke burden, just uh, from the Nansen paper. Uh, we we, we <coughs> divide by the um, different countries, uh, the high income countries and low and middle income countries. We can also find that the hypertension is the most important risk factors, also the smoking. Especially, uh, especially in uh, high com uh, countries, uh, also have uh, some other uh, risk factors like the low fr uh, fruits and vegetable intake. So we will talk about it later. Uh, uh, with regard to the situation in China. Uh, just mentioned uh, the paper in the simulation cardiovascular quality and outcomes. They use a model to calculate the uh, proportion of cardiovascular disease attributed to the selected ma uh, major risk factors in China. So we can also find that the smoking, ac uh, active smoking, and passive smoking is a very important issue in China for both. Uh, uh, for both the CHD and the stroke in males. And also we have some uh, data from the uh, uh, black pressure for, uh, the, for the both uh, men and uh, women in, in China. So we will talk about some, something, something about the risk factors instead of the stroke itself. Uh, why we focused on the risk factors? Because you know, actually, uh, we only got the uh, prevalence of stroke and uh, chronic heart diseases, uh, like the tips of the iceberg. But the risk factor is the since under the world. So it's a it's a terrible sense if we if we do not see this this sense. So. Uh, we should know something about the, <laughs> the risk factors because it is uh, just uh, when we have some uh, economically uh, developed uh, process will be, uh, will be affected by the uh, CVD burden and uh, like that health uh, burden in the global view. So we, we have some lessons from the Titanic, so it is not a romantic story. It's a, it's a mini, it's a nightmare, and uh, we we should uh, we should find the danger ahead. Uh, firstly, we talk about the tobacco use in China. It is the most important modifiable uh, uh, risk factors for uh, cardiovascular diseases. This picture is from the uh, official uh, website of China. China administrator, uh, administration of tobacco, uh, tobacco company. So you can find that the, the trend of the increase uh, dramatically. And uh, also we have some, uh, we, we, we guys uh, focused on the public health or global health will uh, do something to, 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 uh, to stop smoking or smoking cessation. Um, we have a lot of uh, methods, including the chewing gum and the patches and uh, the sprays and also the cigars to keep the, uh, the smokers to, to quit smoking. But since it's not so simple, because you know actually smoking is not just a behavior; uh, it is actually a disorder. Because you know actually from the um, paper from Nature Review Genetics, they show that the, ha the heritability of smoking. Heritability means the proportion of genetic factors than the environmental factors. So we can show the higher heritability means the higher proportion of genetics underlying the disease or the trait itself. 
So we can find that smoking is a very important, has a very important genetic background for the uh, uh, <coughs> structure every day and also the yes or no smoking, uh, uh, smoking or not. So from the, the picture we can uh, we can have have this impression that smoking itself is not just a behavior. We could not just tell people do not smoke, to do not smoke because they they could not control themselves actually. So uh can I ask a question okay. about that slide? Um, how do you know I don't understand from this how you know that smoking is mm -hmm. irritable? Uh, actually, uh, this this study uh, this study is from the Nature Review Genetics paper. They use the uh, uh, twin study. You know, twin study uh -huh. is a, a very uh, suitable model for the genetic study because the twins have the same genetic background for the MZ monozygous twins and uh, share the half of the genetic uh, genetic background for the diagnosis. Dizagged uh, go, uh, twins. So we can use this kind of model to to clarify what's the proportion for the trait or the disease mm -hmm. in in the model because it is a, a naturally uh, randomized uh, uh, control comparable controls the same data birth and the same uh, inner invariation and also the family. Uh, environment situation, so we can compare that, uh, distinguish the uh, contribution of genetic uh, contribution and the environmental uh, contribution from the twin study. So from the twin study, we, we have this impression uh, smoking is not just a, a behavior, they have a strong genetic background. So we can define the smoke, the status of smoke into never smokes and former smokes of uh, current smokers and the new nicotine dependence. That is a, a very <coughs> high risk smoke status. So uh, when we compare the former smokers and uh, never smokers, that means that means we have some persistence. If they can quit smoke, maybe they are former smokers. No, because you can, uh, if they can quit easily, because they have do not have the uh, smoking assistant. And uh, when we compare the current smoke with the never smoke, that means uh, initiation. It means uh, when, when or how easy they 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 they, they are uh, likely to smoke. And uh, when we compare the different groups uh, according to the FT and D scores, we can distinguish the most important smoking behaviors, uh, uh, smoking status into the nicotine dependence. That is important disorder, actually. You know, we have some aid, uh, aid of uh, smoking section, uh, cessation uh, therapy for this kind of patient. Um, from the uh, from the physiological point of view, we have some biological pathways, including the smoking behavior. Uh, main pathway uh, includes the nicotine metabolism that will metabolism, uh, met metabolism the nicotine into the uh, to other uh, other uh, neurotransmitters to the brain. So this this is the most important genes of the, the proteins. The, uh, in the body. And another is a nicotine st uh, stimulated reward pathway. That means it take, a f uh, take effects in the, our brain. So in this picture, we have several uh, neurotransmitter uh, uh, transmitters, uh, genes in, this, in, in the brain. So when the nicotine enters into the brain, across the brain, a uh, blood brain uh, virus, so they can stimulate the nicotine receptor in the brain, and the, uh, when the receptors are stimulated, we have a pressure of the, we have a feeling of pressure. So that means we can have fun. So we will smoke. 
if we do not smoke, so the nicotine will will will, will stop. So we, we have some 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 signs to, to to uncomfortable. So that is a mechanism uh, underlying. Um, so our previous work focused on these kind of uh, uh, risk factors in some pharmacogenomics uh, area. So we found that the association between more more a polymorphic polymorphisms, which is uh, uh, one of the genes in the nicotine-stimulated reward pathway genes. So these genes is associated with the uh, nicotine dependence. And also we have some uh, data, data show that COMT genes also have same, same uh, effects, especially for the age of smoking initiations. That is uh, different uh, than the AOA genes. Uh, in addition, our, mm, our paper showed some gene-gene interactions involved in these uh, mechanisms because you know actually the two pathways may be contributed all together to the smoke to the smoking behavior so we just we focus one pathway we just uh, could take one uh, one of the part into consideration so we should uh, take whole the whole path into consideration so we do some changing interaction studies find that the substantial influence of CYP2A6 polymorphisms as well as the, we previously find the MOA, MAOA genes will result in a risk modulations in the smoking in male Chinese. Because you know, uh, the, the uh, females in Chinese uh, have limited prevalence of smoking in China maybe 3%. It's not like the, United, uh, the situation in the United States. So we just uh, take into uh, take the males into, uh, into consideration. Um, another another aspect of the uh, respect is hypertension. <coughs> so we, uh, uh, all of us know the hypertension is most important risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. So we should control the hypertension by drugs, but you know actually most drugs maybe do not uh, suitable for everyone. So we have some studies about the pharmacogenomics study of hypertension in our uh, in our population because uh, our hypothesis is that all patients receive the same treatment is not response equally because you know actually we have some. Uh, heterogeneities in the population. If we do not consider that situation, we do not have the most effective, uh, the most effective uh, results in our study. So you know, we have some responders with uh, uh, with treat uh, can treat with a conventional uh, drugs or dose. They can take effect, but in other patients, we do not have this effect. Also, they could have some toxic uh, toxic response or side effects like the yellow patient or like that. So we should distinguish the heterogeneity in the whole population. This is a point of view uh, from the uh, pharmacogenomics uh, study. Also, we have some pharmacodynamics uh, of the ACEI pathway. You know, actually, ACEI uh, drugs is widely used in, uh, in, in Chinese hypertensive uh, patients. So when we have some uh, ACEI inhab ACE inhibitors, so they have some uh, target in several in several target. Also, they have some uh, complicated uh, complex uh, um, pathways or some uh, physiological uh, physiological. Uh, process in this uh, in this uh, in these mechanisms. So we will talk about uh, later. Um, based on uh, that hypo uh, hypothesis, uh, our previous work uh, focused on the AGT AGTR1 have uh, gene polymorphisms with uh, the ACEI therapy in hypertensive Chinese uh, patients. 
that paper published in circulation in 2007. And uh, in addition, we have also we also have some gene gene interaction evidence recently published in pharmacogenetics uh, genomics in 2011. That is, is say some gender specific gene gene interactions were involved in the impact of therapy of effect of the ACEI drugs to the hypertensive patient. For example, in the male population or male patients, the interactions of AGT gene and uh, ACE2 genes were involved. However, in the female uh, patients, we have the AGTR1 gene and the AGT genes. We, we just mentioned that we found the previous name involved. So the gender specific interactions or gene interactions were distinguished what kind of uh, patient should use this kind of uh, this kind of uh, drug. So it's very important in the clinical uh, point of view. Uh, when we're talking about the, the genetics of the stroke itself, we have some uh, dis uh, disappointed uh, uh, re results recently because you know actually the International Stroke Genetics Consortium just published the paper of the genome wide association study, but they do, could not find any association uh, even in a large sample size as much as 2,000 patients and 2,000 controls, but they find nothing. No signal was indicated. And also, the sibling with the ischemic stroke study, which is a family based study in the United States, they used the, the uh, siblings and the history of stroke and um, back to siblings to find uh, a signal in the chromosomes uh, 3P and 6P. They find some uh, association in this area, So, and, but they could not find any significant at the genomic level. So what's, what's wrong with it? So we are curious about that. Um, this picture is adapted from the Nature 2009. They say that the missing heritability, we just mentioned the heritability means the proportion of the genetic contribution. So why, why we could not find the, the, the genetic contribution uh, of single genes? That means maybe we have uh, every gene, minor genes, they have uh, limited uh, effects on the disease itself. However, all together, the gene all together will interact each other and have a, uh, have a modified or, or, or modi uh, modified effect to increase the risk of the disease. That means gene gene interactions. Um, <coughs> on the other hand, we also have some uh, environmental risk factors like the uh, dietary. So we have some evidence from the Lansing paper about the homocysteine, homocysteine and the MTHFR genes in the, uh, in the low dietary of fairly intake countries or uh, areas. So it's a very interesting paper, especially for Chinese population. You know, actually, in China, we do not have the folate supplement regulation uh, uh, for Chinese population. Actually, in the United States or North America, we do have this situation. So we do not worry about this situation. Um, it, it's a very uh, specific area in, the, uh, in, in China. So ident identification, interaction, genetic and uh, env environmental risk factors may enhance <coughs> the identification of stroke risk and uh, the prevention strategies on the population level. So this is my uh, hypothesis. So, uh, we talk about so so much uh, the studies about the population level and the, the, the individual level. So what's the epidemiology and the phase of the translational research? They have a, a picture from the American Journal of Epidemiology. They said that we could have the, this round. We have the population health and disease burden, and uh, from this uh, to to the scientific discovery, we have the T T zero phase. And also has some can candidate uh, applications. Use these applications, we can use some uh, 
to give some evidence-based recommendation or policies or guidelines and uh, use this practice uh, guidelines into uh, control program and also we can uh, use some, some method to, to test whether it take effect or not so the whole round of this just take the uh, folic acid and uh, the gene, uh, the MGFIFR gene, for example, we can use this kind of uh, uh, the pictures as a as a as a model of the translational research. Uh, from the uh, global health point of view, we also have this kind of uh, pictures like that. The individual is, is is based on the family, so the family is a cell of the society. So we do not use, uh, we could not use, just use the uh, individual into the host, uh, the, the, the host society because they have some neighborhood or community uh, level effects or they have some family uh, based level effects. So we should take all kinds of things into uh, considerations. So, um, but my study in, tri uh, in in Duke, maybe uh, in this in current stage, we will uh, I will focus on the neighborhood effects of the cardiovascular disease and its risk factors. Maybe it's a, a multi-level studies uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in the population I just mentioned uh, in the rural area of uh, Beijing. So the neighborhood uh, variation exists for the uh, disease, cardiovascular diseases. We, we, we should find out what is the neighborhood factors. So use the modeling, uh, use the modeling uh, method. We can find that the environmental and the individual level of the uh, risk factors and their contribution to the disease itself. So in this population, we can we can <coughs> uh, We have some outcomes like the chronic heart disease and the stroke. Uh, our data va uh, data variable to uh, integrate is that the neighborhood level variables uh, maybe that average incomes and the SES social status, uh, uh, social economic status variables.